Well, we are. Um, um, Gives you tonight, it gives you the right word perhaps it's nice, or, or at least um, blessed is probably even more <laughs> <Honor. laughs> We are honoured, certainly, uh, with uh, Eamon Butler, who's going to give us a talk on uh, a man who's written a book on, uh, and that is Milton Friedman. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Eamon. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, my title is Milton Friedman, statist or, or libertarian. Um, and uh, to me, he's a libertarian, but to you, he's probably a terrible statist. Um, so I thought I, I would probably just describe a little bit about um, uh, his thinking, and then you could uh, make up your own mind. If I speak at this level, can everybody hear me? Yes? You don't want to swap places with somebody who can't? Uh, no? Hey, fine. Okay. Um, well, hi, right, come in. Uh, uh, Milton Friedman uh, was, of course, a 20th century um, economist, uh, born in uh, 1912. He died in 2006, I think, um, in November. And um, uh, he was uh, uh, born uh, near, near New York and uh, raised uh, around that part of the world. Um, he spent some time in... Uh, working for the government during the uh, Second World War when uh, basically anybody of any talent worked for the government. Um, uh, and so he was part of the, the war effort and uh, spent some time in Washington and then went to the National Bureau of Economic uh, Research up in uh, New York and then back down to Washington again. Um, but eventually he um, ended up at the University of Chicago and he is known, I think, as the, the modern father of uh, the quantity theory of money, of, of monetarism, the idea that um, the more money you have in circulation, the more money that uh, governments print, uh, the less it becomes worth, um, and therefore what that means is that prices rise. So he popularised the notion that, um, uh, that, that, that Inflation, which was a very serious problem uh, in the 50s, 60s, and, and 70s, that inflation was um, a purely monetary phenomenon uh, caused by uh, governments uh, playing fast and loose with the supply of money in circulation. And that's really what he's known for as an economist, although he did many other quite important things as an economist. Um, he's also known, of course, for his... Um, uh, book and TV series, um, a couple of books actually, uh, Capitalism and Free Freedom, which came out in 1962, and then uh, his uh, other book, uh, Free, Free to Choose, which is a book that was based on a, a TV series uh, that he did, um, going around the world and looking at different countries and making the case that uh, it is markets and competition and free trade and enterprise and all of these good things, um, which... Um, which actually uh, produce social and economic benefit, uh, and that socialism has the opposite effect. So that's uh, Milton Friedman. That's how he's uh, generally known. He was, I knew him personally, he was, um, uh, well, he was, he was about that high, actually. He was a very short man. And uh, he used to go around with George Stigler, who was six foot four. It was quite, a, quite an amazing difference between them. And, uh, um, uh, he was a great uh, communicator. He, he wrote in columns, regular columns in Newsweek magazine. He wrote in the papers. Um, and uh, he uh, appeared in Senate and congressional hearings and so on and so on. He was a, a, a very fluent communicator of the sorts of ideas which I think probably you and I all, all agree with. So that's Milton Friedman. Um, on the one hand, I think that uh, Milton Friedman, more than anybody, this is where I, I'm wearing my badge saying, have you thanked Milton Friedman today? Um, more than anybody, I think he uh, helped reverse the tide of post-war socialism and of uh, Keynesian economics, um, and to introduce the world to ideas of free markets and free exchange rates and all other sorts of things that were kind of thought to be absolutely unthinkable. Um, prior to, what, about 1960 or 65. Um, and I think more than anybody else, we, we owe a debt to him for doing that. And uh, 
he, of course, um, advised uh, uh, many countries, um, uh, famously uh, Chile, where he told the, uh, uh, the dictator, Mr. Pinochet, that uh, firstly, you should have a free market economy, and then secondly, you should have elections and stand down, <laughs> which pretty much it took a little time, but yes, he did. Um, and similarly, he, uh, when China started to open up, he, he um, was out there in China giving them some advice on how to create a, a more market economy in China. Um, and uh, Matt, Matt La is um, a very interesting chap who was the first um, prime minister of Estonia when Eastern Europe was, was opening up. Uh, and uh, Mark Lahr uh, told me that uh, when he was a, a mere economist under the old Soviet days, that they couldn't get Western uh, economics books. And the only one he was able to put his hands on was free to choose. So he thought, this is what Western economics is all about. <laughs> so we'd better do this. And so he told everybody, right, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> and he said, luckily, he didn't have Western economists there telling him that it couldn't be done. <laughs> uh, so they did it. And it was, of course, a great success. And Estonia became one of the, uh, the leading um, growth countries of the, um, the former Soviet uh, bloc. Um, so uh, I think that Friedman has powerful um, uh, credentials to, call, to be called uh, a libertarian. And yet, at the same time, um, he did work within, if you like, the existing model uh, that F F Friedmanism, if you like, and Keynesianism are two different horses, but they sort of come from the same stable. And they're the same sort of neoclassical view of, of economics. And Friedman himself described himself as a liberal rather than a libertarian. Um, and he said specifically that a consistent liberal uh, is not an anarchist. Uh, so, but, at the, but on the other hand, once again, you know, he did uh, believe in a huge range of human freedom. Um, so where do you stand? Well, let me just take you through some of the different parts of his uh, work and thinking. Um, firstly, on the role of government. If we look at that. As I said, he, think, he said the, the consistent liberal is not an anarchist, so he is not in favour of just tearing up all the laws and starting again. He took the view and he says, um, human beings are not perfect, they're not angels. Um, if they were angels, they would govern themselves without any trouble at all, uh, but they're not angels, and so they need uh, some kind of uh, government, uh, state, whatever you like, some kind of government, he says, in order basically to restrain them. And that he, he, his view is the role of government is to put restraints on people um, to pr promote uh, a harmonious social order. And as I said, um, you know, he, he was close into governments. He advised politicians. He advised Barry Goldwater. He advised uh, uh, Richard Nixon, although he fell out with him when in 1971 uh, Richard Nixon imposed wage and price controls which uh, Friedman was very much against. Um, and uh, he advised Reagan. I mean, all of these things informally, there was no sort of formal contract or anything like that, but these, uh, these politicians uh, went to Milton Friedman, drew him into meetings uh, for, um, for advice. And I suppose on the status side of the, of the balance, I would put, I have to work out which side is status. That's statism, that's libertarianism. So, right, so I'm pointing that way, there's, he's a libertarian, when I'm pointing that way, he's a status, right. <laughs> so on the status side, um, looking at, at the role of government, he thought that uh, government did have a, an extremely important and powerful role. Uh, firstly, of course, it was to maintain uh, law and order, um, and uh, defence, so it had uh, functions over policing and defence. Uh, the, the government was there to adjudicate in disputes uh, when people uh, were arguing on points of property or, or whatever, um, that the state uh, had to be there to provide a system of uh, uh, justice and uh, um, uh, re rebalancing. And uh, the, the state also had an important role in defining what were the rules of property. Uh, Friedman does not believe that uh, property rights are just kind of given and you don't even need to think about them, they're just obvious. 
Um, he says that uh, property is a very complicated uh, set of rules. You know, um, if I own this piece of land, does that stop uh, somebody flying in an airplane uh, over the top? Um, and does it matter whether they make a lot of noise doing it or not? You know, so th these are complicated things to work out, and they're generally worked out um, in courts and other things over over the courses of several generations. So the rules of property are not obvious, and you need some authority to decide what the rules of property actually are. He also thought that government had an important role in uh, promoting competition. Uh, he believed in antitrust uh, law, uh, monopoly legis anti monopoly legislation. Um, he believed that government had a function to maintain sound money. And he, I think, really believed that uh, money was something which was for government to, to issue, uh, maybe not as a logical thing, maybe logically it might be possible for other people to, to issue currency, but when it boils down to it, let's face it, governments issue currency, they always have done, always will, so one function of government would be to, to keep that system of money sound and make sure that money didn't lose its value. He also felt that uh, government had a role in dealing with things like pollution and spillover effects when you, uh, um, uh, when you do something, when you build a factory and the soot um, uh, dirties other people's laundry, well, you know, then the government needs to, to do something about that. And he also believed in a measure of welfare. He says that um, government... Uh, uh, that, that, that you should prefer private charity to help the indigent and uh, uh, destitute, but you might have to supplement that, and that is something which the, the government can reasonably do, uh, and in protecting uh, mentally incapable as well, which is another uh, thing, thing that he believed. So that's all, I suppose, on the, or if you like, the, the status side. On the other side... Well, I mentioned antitrust policy, but I think you could probably put this on both sides, actually, um, because, yes, he, he believed that the government had uh, a role in um, breaking up monopolies, but, yes, he didn't believe in monopoly. He, he thought that competition was uh, very powerful and important and that we should try to make sure that we get it. He also believed that government was too big, very, very eloquent in arguing that case, very effective in arguing that case, and um, that it was too centralised, uh, that in particular power had gone from local authorities and neighbourhoods and so on and, and been drawn into Washington or, 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 or Whitehall. Um, and he had a prejudice against uh, government intervening in things. His view was that most government interventions fail or do the opposite of what they were intended to do. Uh, when you look at things like housing or government job creation policies, these he thought were um, entirely uh, inconsistent, that they, uh, they generally achieved worse housing uh, and uh, cost jobs rather than created them. He, I don't know which side of the balance to put this one on, probably a little bit of both. He did propose um, constitutional limits on government spending. Uh, with so, he promoted the so-called balanced budget am amendment in America, constitutional amendment. And I think you could probably put that on either side. Yes, he, he wanted government spending to be reduced and certainly government borrowing to be reduced but he was quite prepared to use the mechanisms of the state in order to try to achieve that. So that's the freedom on the role of government. Taxation, a bit shorter. Um, on the one side, when Friedman was in, was in Washington during the war, he did actually work on the withholding tax, the sort of American equivalent of PAYE, and he sort of more or less actually invented it. So you could put him down as a terrible statist for doing that. But to his credit, on the libertarian side, he did actually say many uh, years later that uh, a withholding tax was the worst idea that he'd ever worked on, and he regretted having done it, but it seemed a good idea at the time. Um, 
And he also championed uh, flat taxes. I, again, I don't know wh which side of the equation you put this on. I suppose if you're an out and out libertarian, you don't really believe in taxes at all. Uh, but uh, Friedman thought that if you're going to have taxes, have a flat tax, so everybody pays the same. The poor don't pay anything at all, but everybody else pays the same. So we can see what people um, are due, and there's no complicated... Um, uh, exemptions and, and allowances and all of that sort of stuff, which allows Rupert Murdoch to fiddle it and hide behind it and pay nothing. So, um, so there you are. So that's rule of government taxation. In terms of his economic um, approach, before we get on to the sort of political stuff, um, again, I think you could you could put him on the sort of status equ equation because he. He rejected the, the Austrian approach. He was steeped in neoclassical economics, and uh, uh, he did believe that uh, the use of aggregates like the money supply, the price level, uh, the volume of demand, that these were actually all rather useful measures. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that he didn't believe that these things sort of existed somehow on their, their own. He knew that they were statistical measures, but he was a statistician. And he uh, looked at these things and, and looked for relationships between them. Um, and uh, he believed that economics was a science just like any other uh, physical science. Uh, and it should be a predictive science that you should look to see uh, what is going on. You should do your run your statistics, run your measurements, and if you see that you know, two things go up like that, well, you know, that that is a basis for prediction that they will continue to go up like that. And if they go that away, then again, that, that tells you something. And you can make predictions about the future, and. Uh, if you're wrong, you're wrong, and you have to revise your theory, but it's it's the same philosophy of science as it would be for physics or chemistry or um, or any of the other sciences. So uh, that would, um, you know, put Friedman very much on, on, a, on a side which is not occupied by the, the likes of Mises and, to some extent, Hayek, but, but many of the, the mainline um, Hayek. Austrians. Hayek, well, Hayek, that? yes, Hayek is, is, is more sort of... British in that Papa, in British empirical, Papa, yeah, that's right. Uh, but certainly, you know, the the, the German uh, Austrians, if you like, um, they uh, they don't accept that sort of analysis um, at all. Um, on the status side, uh, Friedman memorably did say, "We're all Keynesians now." Uh, but on the libertarian side, his next sentence was, "But in a but in a larger sense, none of us are Keynesians." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because we've moved on from that. And his view was, you know, on this side, I think, again, uh, that um, institutions, uh, Keynesian institutions like the Federal Reserve uh, Bank uh, system, which was, uh, of course, designed um, to prevent bank crises after um, the 1907 bank crisis in America, uh, that um, that system had actually made things worse and indeed had precipitated the, the Great uh, Depression and the banking crisis. Uh, and indeed, the Fed ended up shutting banks, for, shutting all of America's banks for two weeks. You know, And this was an institution which was supposed to stop bank failures and stop banks closing. Um, he also believed that stimulus packages uh, don't work. Uh, that it's all very well to say that uh, we're going to create jobs, but uh, that takes money. And uh, where's the money going to come from? Well, it either comes from taxation, so it comes out of somebody else's pocket, or it comes from inflation, uh, which uh, taxes us all, um, or it comes from borrowing, which is somebody's pocket who doesn't even have a pocket because they're not born yet, as it comes from the next generation. Um, so I think uh, he did have a, a very libertarian view or liberal view, if you like, on, on public spending. No question about that. I said uh, um, that one of his great contributions was um, on monetary theory and inflation. Um, so that's the next thing which I just wanted to review. Uh, I think, again, on, on the libertarian side, you have to say that Friedman was an earnest proponent of how evil uh, inflation was. 
that his view, shared of course by Hayek and many of the Austrians, was that inflation causes unemployment. It's not, it's not a trade-off as people um, thought um, after the war with, with the so-called uh, Phillips curve. People assumed that if you have a, a little bit of inflation, you pump some money into the economy, okay, prices go up a bit, but it creates employment and that in turn creates, you know, people are in jobs and then they go out and spend money and that creates more jobs and you know, Keynesian multiplier and all the rest of it. Um, he thought, no, uh, absolutely not. And he did quite a, a bit of work on, on that. He thought that once again, uh, that inflation disrupted the economy. You know, he says that when all prices are rising, it's very hard to separate the noise of, of all of that from the signal of, you know, one price going up there or one price going down there. And investors need to know what individual prices are doing. So if all prices are going up you know, at weird rates, it's, it's hard to know what's going on. His solution to that was a statist one, which is that the government really ought to get a grip over the uh, supply of money. He thought that a gold standard was probably impractical. Uh, he did advocate uh, at some stage uh, a commodity-backed currency, something that, that was hard and tangible uh, and had a value in its own. But he doubted very much that a gold standard could ever work because, um, you know, we're not going to carry around gold bars to pay our bills and so on. And uh, Small bits of gold. Do if you managed it, yes, and if you, and if you made every transaction in gold, the price of gold would be up there and you'd be talking about such a small bit you know, to, to buy a drink that you couldn't see. So you'd end up, you'd end up saying, well, here's a piece of paper that's worth that much gold. And so you end up, you end up with what you've got at the moment, you, you end up with something which... We'll come back to that. <laughs> you end up with something very like what we've got at the moment, which is uh, a system which can be abused, is it, one thing, that you can over-issue these warehouse receipts, um, and that gets you in the same problem we are really with, with fiat currency. So his, his answer was uh, a monetary rule um, uh, that uh, the supply of money established by governments should expand at a fairly smooth rate, which roughly um, reflected the increase in the productivity or output of, of, of the economy. Um, so that there was always enough money and prices weren't rising and prices weren't generally falling. And he also believed that uh, government services, you know, pensions, uh, welfare benefits and taxes should be indexed so that governments couldn't benefit from having a sudden uh, spurt of inflation, printing money, letting prices go up so that they could then repay their debts as we're doing now in devalued uh, currency. On the libertarian Austrian Hayekian side, um, he did uh, argue for 100% reserve banking. Um, he didn't think it was very likely to happen, but at the same time, uh, the likelihood of something happening never actually stopped him advocating things. And, and he said that economists are usually very bad judges of what's politically possible, so you might as well say what you believe in. Um, and hope that it might actually happen. And also, I suppose, you, uh, just to put this under money as well, he was a lead, leading advocate of floating exchange rates. He believed that fixed exchange rates were simple price fixing like any other uh, price fixing. And it's just like the price of bread. If the price is too low, um, then people uh, buy lots of bread and use it for all sorts of purposes like building material. Uh, rather than as food, and, and that uh, exchange rates were exactly the same if the dollar was too, too low, um, you know, then people would want as many of them as they could get, or as few of them as they could get, I should say. Um, regulation is another heading where I think uh, it's interesting. Um, on regulation, Friedman was pretty liberal, liberal libertarian. He wanted to see the end of price controls, which he thought um, had driven up the cost of housing and driven down, in particular, the quality of housing, which uh, he said, you've only got to look at New York to, to see that, whether it's had uh, rent controls for, for many decades. He believed in uh, ending the mail monopoly. He said the only reason that uh, the United States government had a, a monopoly of the mail is because the Pony Express did such a good, good job that they, they, the feds couldn't compete. 
Um, and he, and I think this is quite radical, he uh, was opposed to licensing of um, any professions, including you know, doctors and lawyers. Um, he thought that uh, private institutions might do this uh, job uh, and probably do it rather better. But he was very suspicious of regulations, and, and he writes uh, um, in great length about, really going back to Adam Smith, about the, the tendency of businesses, big businesses in particular, uh, to demand regulations from the, the politicians because that, that helps them, because big business businesses can get along with regulations and small businesses can't because it costs them too much money. Uh, big business can have a fleet of compliance officers, a small business can't. And so it, uh, it reduces competition. And he felt that uh, big business uh, was, was one of the, uh, uh, well, they were no friends of the free market. And a lot of regulation came from, from that source. Um, on the sort of status side, he did believe in the re registration of a number of um, professions. I mean, he says in sp specifically, you know, you, you get in a taxi in, in New York and indeed in London or wherever, wherever you are in uh, Rome or, or whatever, and there's a, there's a number there and it's a registration number um, so that you know if the man, if the driver cheats you, you get taken the wrong way or something happens, or you get assaulted. There's a, a number there which is relatively easy to remember. So the, that person, the driver, can be identified um, and brought to book. So he thought that s simple things like that, of course, uh, were um, uh, entirely OK. Um, I, I don't know quite where that ends, of course. Um, you know, you can have all sorts of little rules like that that end up costing businesses quite a lot of money. But, but he did believe in some uh, controls like that. In terms of the human services, health, education, welfare, um, he was uh, fairly libertarian on, on that. He didn't believe in compulsory schooling. He, if parents didn't want to send their kids to school, he didn't see why they should be forced to. Um, at the same time, he did think that, well, we have to deal with the education system that we're given, which is 90-something percent uh, state, and uh, developed or or rediscovered, I suppose, it's a 19th century idea, but developed the, rediscovered the idea of um, education vouchers, which is, you know, pretty, pretty much of a sort of state solution where, um, but it's introducing competition within the state sector. So you, you, you can still have public and private schools, uh, but you have a system whereby uh, parents are given a voucher for the value of the, uh, an education, which they can then uh, spend at any uh, school they like. He didn't conceive of that, I don't think, as being a sort of private enterprise system. He, he conceived of that as being uh, a government-run system, but he believed in it because he thought it was a lot better than, than what we have now. He didn't believe in state-run medicine, but he, looking at uh, state pensions, again, I think he thought this was sort of inevitable, uh, but it would be much better to replace the, the state uh, pay-as-you-go pyramid scheme, Ponzi scheme, uh, with a uh, one which is based on personal accounts that you pay into when you're young and then you can draw the money out when you're older. Um, he, on the welfare front, um, he didn't believe in a minimum wage. He thought that that was counterproductive. Um, he didn't believe in price controls uh, to help poor people. Uh, he did believe in a negative income tax. Uh, you know, he, he thought that you had to do something uh, to help uh, poorer people, and that rather than have lots, uh, 101 or he did he did give give a number of something like 306 different American state programs to, to help the poor, uh, just give them the money and then they can go away. They're not poor anymore, uh, so that kind of solves the problem. Uh, so he thought that that would be a, a much better way of doing it. But it is you know it's a, it's it it is definitely a sort of state. Um, welfare measure. In terms of the individual and the state, um, he does, did take much of his thinking from John Stuart Mill. Um, he, uh, at the end of um, capitalism and, and freedom, he tears into uh, President Kennedy's uh, inaugural address where, he, where Kennedy says, don't ask what you know, your 
country can do for you. It's it's completely what, what statist. You can do it, that's right. And he ta- attacks that as being completely statist, and, it's, and, and, and he believes that the individual must come first, and the state is just a group of individuals getting together for mutual purposes, but, it, but the individual takes, takes priority. So I put him on the liberal, libertarian side of that. And he saw the market and individual freedom as a, a counterweight to, to politics. So he wanted to, to grow markets and have more done by the markets because that took power from politicians. He was against the draft, the military draft, uh, sending uh, kids to, to Vietnam, um, and eventually successfully, too. Um, and, of course, he believed that drugs should be decriminalised. He thought that most of the harm that came from drugs were, was due to the fact that they were illegal rather than that they were nasty substances. They are nasty substances, or some of them are nasty substances, but at the same time it was the illegality which caused most of the problem. So I put him on the um, libertarian side there. So I don't know where that leaves you. I mean, I think he's, uh, you know, he's, got, he's a bit of both. Uh, he, he believed in smaller governments and uh, uh, competition and choice and free trade and all of these good things. And yet, uh, he was, I suppose, if you like, a realist and, and figured, well, you know, the, the state is, well, at the moment, what, it's 50% of our lives. Uh, so uh, you have to deal with that. And sometimes uh, the power that the state has can be a, uh, a useful one in order to create uh, new markets and indeed to uh, wither away the power of the state itself. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Refresh our glasses, and as you said, one or two people are drinking. Should we refresh our glasses for a while? Oh, yes, I'm all right, but five minutes. You, you, you're okay with us? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks very much. For a few we minutes, talking. <laughs> whatever you like. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, you can refresh your glass. First things first, eh? You're the lavatory. Well, you can refresh other parts. <coughs> um, what do you think? I mean, uh, really. <clears throat> what do I think? I think he was the the greatest force for liberty that we have seen in a hundred years. I think he's a great <laughs> advocate of competition. Yes. Right. Free business, but not free banking. Mm-hmm. It's pretty much him. Yeah. But why did he have this... Well, it must be... Is it a Katie thing? The Chicago School thing. That you must have. You must... How can I put it? You must accommodate growth by increasing the money supply. Why did he think that? Uh, I think probably he had taken the you know the Keynesian view that falling prices had problems. Uh, that you know deflation is is it it does cause cause difficulties. Well, and, and what he wanted is zero, basically. Sure. Obviously, if prices plunge by thirty percent in a year, that's that's not good. Right, well, maybe. But as George Selden has said, there's good good deflation and bad deflation. If it's if it's just Gently falling prices because of increased productivity, as the Victorians had. Yeah, that's no bad. You, you get a certain well, you get a certain stickiness. I mean, according to Keynes, you, uh, wages, for example, are inflexible down downwards. Nobody likes taking a pay cut, and so if you've got inflation, it's not so obvious that you're taking a pay, pay cut, and therefore, you know, wages can adjust more easily. Whereas if inflation is zero. It's bloody obvious that you're getting a, a pay cut, and people resist that. You see, so if it's not a real pay cut, I mean, if the pay buys more than ever, would they be so fast? They'd be a bit fast. No, I see. You mean if, if yeah, price, productivity is improving and all that form. kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So not Maybe the so. other way around as well. If inflation is um, running high, the demand. Well, they do actually. Yes, yes. Yeah, we discovered that during the, like, you know, during the late sixties, early seventies, that what would happen is the the unions would, you know, you got inflation at twelve percent, the unions would bargain for twelve percent, plus a pay increase, another two, and then plus the twelve that they thought they'd probably lose next year. So they were, so they were demanding like you know twenty six percent. Pay increases, um, so that's a, that is a problem too. But but that's only under that, that's when inflation is high. If inflation is one or two percent, then people don't notice it very much. But that it gives you that, according to Keynes at least, it gives you that flexibility to, for wages to adjust, which it wouldn't do if it was zero. I'm not saying I agree with all that, but wasn't influenced by Fisher who believed in basic inflation? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean he. 
the, the, in his essay on the quantity theory of money, he goes through all of these formulations. The the you know starting well starting with David Hume and so on that that, that you know the more money you create, the, the less it's worth, and then and then going on to to Fisher, and then the the, Cam the Cambridge uh, formulation. It goes through all of these different. Was he a pupil of Fisher? I forget. It was quite heavily influenced. I think he was influenced by him. I don't think he was ever a pupil of, of Fisher's. I don't think so. Yeah, go on. Did you want to? Yeah, I was. Uh, I was very interested to read in, in in your book that that his first degree was in mathematics. And it's always a bad sign, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. And he did his, uh, and uh, well, he, then I think as a postgraduate, he was a statistician. That's correct. I just wonder whether he would have been. Uh, I, choose, I choose my words carefully. I wonder, I wonder if those parts of his economics that I think some of us feel quite uncomfortable with I mean, uh, might have featured less prominently in, in his work if he hadn't had that background. Yeah, well, I think you're probably right. Uh, yes, mathematics was what he was good at. And um, he, uh, uh, you know, at school he was very gifted in, in mathematics and that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, he he was advanced. Well, well he, he started studying studying mathematics, and then it was basically by chance that he that he met some economists and thought this this uh, economics stuff is pretty good, so let's do that. And and therefore, yes, his approach to e economics is very non-Austrian and, and it's very mathematical and it's very statistical. Um, but Friedman defended that. Uh, Friedman said that if you know you do the statistics, and if you see that there is a relationship between one figure and another, then it sort of indicates that there's something going on which is interesting, and you can uh, you can use that as the basis of prediction. Uh, you don't you don't necessarily know what the mechanism is, but if when A goes up, B always goes up. Well, yeah. I, you know, fine. And yet, when he said that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, mm. that doesn't really sound like simply a sort of assertion based on examination of lots of data. <laughs> it sounds like a general theory. Oh, that's the, that's the wisdom of decades distilled uh, into, into one phrase. <laughs> yeah, so he sort of he coined that on a trip to India, I think it was. He was uh, give, giving some lectures and was just trying to sort of encapsulate his his view. No, I mean, actually, if you look at his monetary theory, which is far too boring to discuss here, but that's basically... Right, as a theory, isn't it? Um, just a correlation. Oh, yes, that's right. But, but, but that's his view of the philosophy of science, which is that you propose a theory, and the theory is, uh, in, in economics, uh, this magnitude, this um, aggregate or this statistic does that. Well, when it does, this one goes that, and so on and so on. That is a theory. Your theory is that that will carry on happening. And, you know, tomorrow it might not happen, and then you have to adjust your theory. But his view was that, that trying to understand the world is, is a, a process of theorizing, that, that you put forward a, a point of view that I think, I think it works this way, and as long as it works that way, that's fine. You know, Newton uh, put forward a theory which lasted for a very long time, but then people start saying, yeah, but there's this little discrepancy here. What about that, which you can't explain? And then you have to adjust your theory. So he thought that, that economics was a scientific endeavor, which Mises would have him shot for, obviously. Bob? Yes. Um, apart from the fact that he said, to say it doesn't matter if it's true or not, <laughs> it's just useful or it's, it's, it, it predicts. It doesn't matter how uh, radical the uh, assumptions are as long as it gets the right answer. That's right. Mm. That's <laughs> and also the trouble with saying, and this goes with this, is that when, um, if we're old enough, and you may be old enough, to remember when he came to address some meeting of uh, powering economists, I don't think it was the Royal Society, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't have economists there. Anyway, it was some bare pit of a terrorist uh, hole, and he was addressing them. And he was saying, well, look, here, here you have the money supply, you have inflation, you know. Yeah. And he said, um, and, and, when, um, and when the federal, the confederate uh, printing works... No, that's right, <laughs> yes. ...the money was being printed, were, were captured, the inflation stopped. And he said, oh, you're advocating, you know, confiscating the printing works, you know. 
<laughs> but of course, but that's coronation. They were saying, yes. as did the Germans in the 1920s, 1920s, 1920s that you can't print enough money. You just can't. The prices are going up so fast. We have to get this money well, out. Well, that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what happens. They could argue that it was um, whatever they called it, cost push, cost pull, whatever it was. It doesn't matter. Terms don't matter. The point is, they thought it was the fact that people are asking for a lot more. Right. Therefore, a lot more money had to be created just to keep the whole thing going. Yeah. Well, uh, Friedman, you'll have to read the book. Uh, Fr Friedman has a, a very simple illustration against that. I think, I'm not sure where it uh, occurs. I think it might have been in one of his Newsweek columns that he wrote every third week for many years. And um, he says, prices are going up in America, this is. And he says, um, who's to blame? Well, you know, you ask the shopkeeper, and the shopkeeper says, well, I can't help it. You know, my wholesaler is, is putting the price up. And you ask the wholesaler, and the wholesaler says, well, I can't help it. You know, my prices are going up. You know, the cost of my energy is going up, and the price of uh, fuel is going up, and uh, transportation costs are going up, and then my raw materials are going up. And then you ask the people who produce the power and the energy and the and the transportation and the raw materials, and they say, well, no, my costs, my costs are going up as well. You see? So everybody says... Um, you know, I'm not raising prices just for the hell of it. I'm raising prices because my prices are, are going up. And he says, and you trace that back. And where does the buck stop? And the answer is it stops at the printing press in the, in the Treasury in Washington. Uh, and, and that was really his, his view of, of inflation, that it, that, it, that it wasn't cost push or demand pull or anything like that. It was simply due to the amount of money in circulation. You know, and the amount of money in circulation is a difficult concept and there's different sorts of money and all the rest of it. But that's really what it boils down to. And therefore, it is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That's where it comes from originally. And yes, there may be spurts of demand for one reason or another, and there may be exceptional costs that, that come in, you know, like the oil crisis and all of that, in the, in the 70s and all of that sort of stuff. It can only have a temporary effect because if there's a certain amount of money in, in circulation and one price goes up, well, another's got to come down because you know, there just isn't enough money to go around. Well, it was said at the oil, or the oil, sorry, it was said at the oil crisis that the oil prices pushed up every other price, but well, it, yeah, other well, of course it has. Other it. prices would have come down. Yeah, but 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 if there's only a certain amount of money in the economy, yeah. then <laughs> where does the money come from to push the prices up? <laughs> so, in other words, the price has to go down somewhere else. David, well, there was a. A tantalizing passage in your book where you refer to Friedman at his most radical, suggesting that perhaps money should be denationalized altogether. Can you elaborate on that? Because I don't know where. <laughs> <laughs> Crumbs. Uh, it's, you've got me. You've got me. It's, it's Did you say I think on. Uh, did he say that? Uh, well, he said freeze the monetary base, which is almost the same thing. No, I, well, the suggestion that he... Well, he kept on inflation. I'll tell you what, why don't you take another question while I find the passage? Uh, <laughs> that sounds sensible. Is there any other question coming forward? Did he find the narrow or broad boundaries of money in Africa? Um, well, he... Now, let me... I've got this. Another question I don't actually quite remember the answer to, but um, he was fully aware that, that there were lots and lots and lots of possible de definitions of money, and that almost anything could be used as money, you know, houses can be used as money to some extent, um, and therefore, you know, there is a continuous uh, spectrum. I think that, I think he believed that the most useful uh, measure was, uh, oh, thanks very much. All right, yeah, thanks very much. Was um, basically notes and coins in circulation and bank um, current accounts. In other words, a pretty narrow definition of money. And he thought that was the, that had the biggest predictive power. And I think he's probably right, actually. Um, it seems to be, it seems to be the case. Um, and, and, and that's why he thought that it was so important that the uh, government should control the apex, if you like, so that it was the notes and coins which, which then affected everything else. Uh, so notes, notes, coins, and, and uh, uh, immediate deposits. Yeah. So, what's, 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 what's he say here? 
Uh, well, 100% reserve requirements. I, I said that. Yes, that's right. Okay. Have to keep the entire amount of their customers' deposits in their vaults. Yes, rather than mm-hmm. lending. Although, although right. banks could still be investment banks as yeah. well. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. But you had to have the option that if you wanted a really safe bank that, that you could... It's the last thing. Yeah. Okay. The banks would still conduct investment business, lending out funds to clients for, for this purpose, but uh, this would become entirely separate. Friedman would also stop the banks buying government debt. Um, at his most radical, ah, yes, Friedman proposed entirely abolishing central banks. Ah, right, central banks, which he argued so corrupted were so corrupted by their closeness to politicians they couldn't be trusted to manage the money supply responsibly. Better let money be produced like other goods by the private market. Yeah. We'll, we'll get him to give a talk on Eamon Butler. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot more about the subject than I do. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, I mean, I think you know he did occasionally say yes, we should we should abolish. It. Well, I mean, he said quite a number of times. Yeah, let's abolish the Fed. He did long enough to say many things. Let's you know, yeah, indeed. Let, let's let's abolish the Fed. I'm not sure I agree on that. Um, you do need a you do need a lender of last resort oh, somehow. Well, put that very. <laughs> <laughs> that's very wrong. Very wrong. Resort, that's what they are. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good tension. That's a <laughs> but uh, I mean, is it the case, from your understanding, that Friedman's? Uh, I, mean, I mean, he's he's very well known, obviously, for the suggestion that. It is the role of government to ensure that there is a gentle expansion in the money supply, yes. as you say, to match uh, the yes. increase in production. Yeah. But was that something that he thought in principle was a good thing? Or would he, all things being prefer to leave the supply of money to the market, as was on one occasion suggested by Hayek, and as is a sort of very universal view, I think, of most of the Austrians. So was what he was proposing a sort of, well, if the government is going to do it, then we should have constitutional rules to make sure that the expansion of the money supply is very, very limited and it can't be interfered with by politicians? Or did he regard that actually as being the best of all possible worlds? No, I, I, I think that he took the position that, let's face it, money is produced by governments, and it's always going to be produced by governments, and we might dream, or I might dream. I don't know, actually. I don't really remember him he dream? talking. I don't think he did. Because I mean, no, I don't think he did. I don't think he did. And, he, and, and I, think, I think he, you know, he was sufficiently steeped in neoclassical economics, and even in, you know, I mean, he was... He grew up in the Keynesian era. Well, it was a positive role. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Good thing. Uh, the, the, you know, I, I, I think he assumed that money was one of these things that you, you could only have one, basically. You couldn't have lots of them. It just didn't kind of make sense. Except lots of them. We have 200 of them. <laughs> it's, I, I heard, not very far from here, actually, but it was many, many, many years, decades indeed ago, Ludwig Lachmann, uh, talking about Hayek on the denationalisation of money, um, and was saying that even for Hayek, that wasn't a sort of noble aspiration. It was a, a, a sort of desperation that that you know, things had got so bad that I mean, what could you do? All you can do is to suggest that well, you know, perhaps we should allow people to, to create uh, money money of their own and have some competition, but. It, you know, it wasn't as if this this was a, a sort of shining image that, that, that he had. It was just a way of doing something that was better than the the monopoly that, that we had at, at, at the moment. So, you know, I, I mean, I've heard this, the same said of, of Hayek, in other words, curiously. Oh, um, oh he's uh, had too many goes. Sorry, I, 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 I think someone else though. Yeah, yes, 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 oh, yeah, did you have your hand up? But just following up, so, so, so I guess uh, Friedman would have been. I, I'm curious what his thoughts would have been on a development like Bitcoin or trading over video. He probably well, wouldn't have been too much of a. Fortunately for me, he's safely and quietly dead, so I can't tell <laughs> <show> you. <him. laughs> but so the. I think he, sort of in, in principle. My guess like is. My guess is, from what I remember of him, I, my guess is that he would say, "Oh, well, that's all very well, but you know, uh, you know, if it works, it'll be really great. But um, you know, we've got the U.S. dollar, and that's what we've got to deal with." I think that's probably what his line would be. 
you know, so you take the reality of the world and, and improve it rather than you know just go out on a limb and and, and as with bitcoins something that may or may not work mm. we don't Simply know unthinkable. well it was very curious on that actually because as i say in one to some extent he was quite restrained in terms of you know, what he what he proposed he he wanted to propose things which were were sort of ex at least acceptable but at the same time he also said that the politicians are very bad judges of what's politically doable um, so you know go for it uh, because it, it might be doable I, I mean things like the floating exchange rates which are thought unthinkable uh, for most of the post-war era and I and I, and I remember you know, I've talked about it. Uh, you know, people like Geoffrey Howe, the uh, Chancellor in Mrs. Thatcher's government, who stood up in the House of Commons one day and said, um, exchange controls have been around far too long and we're going to abolish them. And there was a sort of silence. And people in the press gallery said, um, did he, did, <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> uh, because nobody believed that it was possible. Everybody thought that if you removed exchange controls, you know, currency would flood out of Britain and would flood in other places, and there'd be complete turmoil. Uh, it'd be a market, for goodness sake. And, uh, and nobody would know where they are, uh, and that you had to have capital controls. So, the, you, you know, in the, uh, in the early 80s, um, the government really was sailing on uncharted waters nobody they they didn't know themselves how this was going to pan out you know it could have been the most awful disaster in fact it works famously and and these days you, you and i go abroad and we go down and we change our currency and we get whatever the day's rate and we don't even think about it uh but what 30 years ago that was just unbelievable and it was friedman as, as much as anybody that, that made that change uh, later, there's no one else. Um, yeah, I mean, as a libertarian, I, I of course think that um, the proof is, is on to the state is to prove that the state is a useful institution. And uh, how, where, where did, does Friedman stand on this? Does he just believe that the state is is um, is the is the is the natural thing? And, and, and as a as a liberal, as he calls himself, you have to argue in favour of trying to reduce the amount of state at certain points, or, or does, he, does he actually believe that uh, the state can really do a, 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 the, the greatest job in, in certain areas, like, like licensing and stuff? And if, if, he's, if he thought that, um, how, 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 did, how did he um, argue that point, that, that, right. that the state is, is the best institution to, to do these kind of jobs? Well, my... My answer might start rambling because I've run out of lubrication. <laughs> oh, how kind. Thank you very much. Uh, but, um, no, I, I, um, I don't think Friedman had any um, great love of uh, the state as an institution. Um, he believed in uh, smaller governments. He thought the government had grown too large, that it was doing too too much, or too many different things. It was taking too many powers from the individual, and that individuals were um, should should have priority um, over governments. Um, and yet, somehow he, I don't, I don't I don't really want to overstate this because I mean he was a a huge advocate of smaller government, but he thought the government had some function. Um, and as Adam Smith thought the government had some function, Adam Smith is even more confused about it, but, um, you know, he thought that it had, because of its coercive power, that it, that, that it had some, lim that it must be limited, but that it had some function in terms of administration of justice, um, actually creating this market that we all believe in and uh, creating comp not creating competition but allowing competition to to exist and not not repressing competition by regulations and, and high taxes and all of that sort of stuff so um on 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 any issue i i think he would say to you that yes you know he's on your side he believes in a smaller government uh, but i think that that he also 
took the reality of the situation and was trying to convince politicians, if you like, to do the right thing as much as anybody else. You know, he was, he was intellectually interested in what was the right thing to do, but, but also he was a fantastic communicator and he, he I think he would never have, he wouldn't have been so um, grand to, to admit it but, I, but I, mean, I mean he I think he did think that his skills were to persuade people just to come over a little bit and you know come away from the state a bit and just think of another way of, of doing this like, like licensing doctors you know again almost unthinkable even today that we should not license doctors. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But, you know, he said, well, yeah, it's, I, you know, he did a long study on professional licensing and um, he indicated, you know, and that proved to him that licensing um, raised the cost to the public and gave them a, a worse service. So get rid of it. But was he an advocate like you have to prove that the state does not work in a certain area in order to justify the abolishment of certain state programs? Uh, because, I mean, that, that's a different kind of argumentation than the libertarian would argue, that uh, you that you actually have to justify it and to show really that a government is, is necessary and useful. Because other than yeah, Adam exactly Smith, what you mean. Friedman, Friedman uh, did know anarchists. So, I mean, he, he, he lived until a, a few years ago, I think, when he died. So, so, so. And, and he, it's, well, his son is very son is, much sounder than he was. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, so he knew the anarchist... Um, Argumentation, and there must be some some argument from him with which he rejected this uh, this argumentation. Phew. Well, <laughs> he and I both knew Murray Rothbard, and I think I probably put him off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Sorry if there are any friends of Murray Rothbard. I never liked the man, but um, uh, his prejudice, if you like, and it's a good prejudice was always in favour of less government. I'm, I'm not sure, I think he's a bit like me, that he, that he doesn't have a, a sort of blueprint of how society ought to be. I mean, I mean you know, you can argue that that's one of the problems is people who have blueprints as to how society ought to be ordered. But I think his view and mine is, let's try scrapping a few things and see, see, see if it still works. And if it still works, that, then that's just fine. Oh, good man, you got yourself some at the same time. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very, good, very good, very good, very good. But then the, his advocacy for the school voucher program shows that he's willing for the government to, to reform as much as, as long as you increase competition, it's still okay for the Yes, that's right, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I think sort of on education, I think that, that's a, a reasonable example. Uh, look, right, you know, the state's run education for the last 150 years. Um, there's no sign that it's ever going to retreat. So what can we do to draw its fangs? Um, and what can we do to, to start growing, if you like, a better system? Um, and it's, I always say this is, this is the French barn technique, right? You, you buy a, you know, if you want to build a house in northern France, you can't do it, right? Planning permission and all the rest of it. So what you do is you buy a barn, an old barn, then basically you build a house inside it is what you do. And then eventually, because of the weather, the barn falls to bits and you're left with a house. And I think he was sort of, <coughs> he took that sort of view of, of, of politics, that, that, that you, you set in form, in, in, in flow, a, a few reforms which which then actually undermine the whole state project because you know the more people that you can move say from state education into a voucher system they'll love it and then they won't want the state thing anymore so his prejudice was the state's rubbish in education we know it's rubbish in education if i stand up and say it's rubbish in education nothing's going to happen but if i produce a mechanism which may rely on a you know a state administration of a program uh, but I produce I produce um, a project which will actually make that one wither away. Well, that's great. So I think that's that's what he can even sort of practical political approach almost. Oliver, uh, given the uh, title of the talk and the status of what he did, do you think Friedman and the
forward. Did you think that the man called the self missing people were just going to just go perfectly right now? Just leave it as a thing. No, he certainly didn't think that it was self-limiting, and you know he 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 writes in various places. Could, sorry, it could be self-limiting. Could be, could be. Oh, the constitu- we didn't really get into the constitutional stuff. I mean, it didn't come till later, I guess, with Buchanan and Tulloch and all these characters. Although, again, I suppose, uh, yeah, yeah, but. I, I suppose um, calculus of consent by Buchanan and Tullock was, was 62, so that was was quite early. But he, he never really got into that stuff. I don't think um, he he did write about how voracious governments were, and, and you know he he looks at the history of the American government, and the, I don't know in 1910 it takes about 10 percent of the income and then it whoosh and suddenly goes up or it goes up particularly with the um, the New Deal uh, so he was very critical of the um, uh, the Roosevelt uh, era um, and also said that the more programs you had the more concentrated it had to be and that if you if a government is saying, well, we can solve all ills, you know, from unemployment to, you know, prices to whatever, to whatever, then it has to accumulate powers to itself. And that's what tends to happen. And therefore, power tends to come away from individuals and communities and local governments and so on. And, and it comes up, up to the centre. So um, he thought that that was by no means self-limiting. And then... In the tyranny of the status quo, which a book he wrote in, I think, 1984, he says there's a sort of iron tri- triangle. There's the politicians who want more public spending because it, you know, they can use that to, to buy votes and all the rest of it. There's um, the, uh, the 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 bureaucracy, who are, um, you know, again wanted, and there's also business, unfortunately, uh, which again. You know, likes a, a, a strong government, and particularly big business, who, and like all this regulation. And so he's saying that there's that kind of iron triangle sitting there in Washington, um, and it's very hard for the rest of us to to break that up. But but we we must break that up. So it's not a case of this isn't self-limiting at all. No, no question. David, do you think that it would be a fair comment to say that? Uh the further Friedman got away from his core subject, the more libertarian he was. Yes. So you start right in the middle of the sort of pure economic theory. I'm not sure about that. And you go further out. Oh, he's got some good stuff on uh, price control and records, sort of semi-economic. You get more and more out. You've got these great books, British Shoes and Capital and Freedom. You know, really, all, all, all they're not perfect. Undoubtedly, a great propagandist for liberty. And certainly that's the way that I see it, yeah. um, as with many other libertarians. I mean, almost Rothbard, actually. So I think, well, a lot of what Rothbard wrote right in the centre of it, you know, his sort of, his philosophy was a bit sort of dodgy and natural right. Not, not much sure about that. But a great propagandist on any view, you know, whether you like him or not. You know, I hate uh, and I sometimes <laughs> see Friedman like that. Is that a fair comment? Um, yes. I mean, it's interesting that his books on... Um, popular politics. There are three, really. Um, there's, there's Capitalism and Freedom, 1962. There is um, uh, the Jews, 1980. Um, and then there's this 1984 Tyranny of the Status Quo, which is a short book, but it's, you know, I mean, and it's very American. But, the other things that he wrote but, the book. But, but it, no, I'm just saying, but it, but of those three, it's interesting. They're all co-authored by his wife. Yes, that's right. That's even she, shorter than he was. It was even shorter than she was, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> not by very much. She was a little bit short. Um, and uh, that is interesting. And um, he, he said specifically of capitalism and freedom, where it says, by Milton Friedman, with Rose Friedman, and he said that that's a, a gross understatement <laughs> that, you know, she sort of organised it and planned it. Do we have a judge to a and Harriet Taylor? Yeah, there's something like that. Yeah, that, that's right. And so, you know, there is a point of view, uh, and Rose never really, you know, she was not demonstrative, and she just stayed in his shadow and never sort of claimed anything for herself. But, you know, there is a kind of point of view that, that he was a lot better when she was there behind him telling him what to do. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so, yeah, I think I think I think you're probably right. Yes, and, and on things like you know drugs and the draft, he was extremely libertarian. Um, on things like monetary policy, well, you know. Mm. Well, <coughs> years ago, I much enjoyed his. Was he about money? Money and something. Anyway, it was rather good. He was arguing for floating exchange rates. Sure. And given that I was brought up on sad old Britain going down like an old ship, can't pay its way, mm-hmm. um, currency crises, devaluing the pound, <laughs> all this stuff, we have to join Europe and snug it up to richer people than we are, we can't go on like this, right? Yes. And nearly all of it was simply due to the fact that they had inflation with fixed exchange rates. That's it. It wasn't due to, due to lazy workers or incompetent managers. I'm sure there were plenty. No, that's right. But still, yeah, I think that's right. the mere crises were simply they had inflation with a fixed exchange rate. This is dumb... Dumb. Well, what, you know, what, what... And he was good at pointing out you can have floating ones. But some libertarian economists now say yes, and they plunged like stones once they floating were allowed to nowhere. float. Oh, yeah, sure. So, yeah. Um, it, what, what you have to... Buy the book and, uh, you know... And what... Yes, absolutely. And, you know, what, what, I, what I'm saying is, I think, uh, yeah, chapter one is... I've called it the economist who changed everything because he did change everything because during the during the war after the war 50s 60s part of the 70s everybody believed this stuff right and and they just thought there was no other way of doing it that you had to have a fixed exchange rate that it would be absolute crisis if you didn't and think that exchange rates would be all over the place and so on. And they thought um, they didn't know that inflation was caused by money. Just didn't know. So you could, you could print as much money as you want, all the rest of it. And, um, and, and he changed all that. And, and it was almost unthinkable at the time. People got trapped in the downward spiral. I, I emigrated to America, for God's sake, in the 1970s, right? Because I saw no, no hope, hope for this country. Because it was in the, exactly that downward spiral you've, you've described. And it's purely a spiral caused by regulation of exchange rates and <laughs> all the rest of it, the economic sclerosis. Um, and, you know, his view was, well, that's all crazy, you know, it's, you know, just have the market, you know, have the market in exchange rates and, and, and so on. And everybody thought, this guy's, you know, he's, he's, and they really did, and they vilified him, and they, um, you know, and people thought that he was just, yeah, complete barking outside. And in fact, he, he says, I hope I can remember this, uh, he says at one, at one stage that, um, you know, there are four stages, you maybe remember it better than I do, uh, in, in the acceptance of an idea. You know, firstly, everybody says, oh, it's completely crazy. Oh, no, firstly, they say they don't even acknowledge that you exist, right? The, the status quo is the status quo, and that's it, and there's this, you know, outside, and they don't even... They don't. And then they sort of acknowledge that you exist, but say, oh, he's, he's completely, completely crazy. You know, you know, there you go, it's Friedman guy. And then they say, well... You know, there may be something in what this Freeman chap says, you see. And then afterwards, oh, yes, we all believe in that. <laughs> <laughs> we all believe in your own. That's right. And, and that's how it works, you know. And, and, it's, and people are very loath to give up their, uh, their prejudices. It's all, you know, cute and structure of scientific revolutions and so on. They're, they're, you know, people don't give up what, what, what they've been bred in, into because that's what they believe. Of course, believe. what you've just told, told of is a story where they do give up their prejudices. Well, you understand that. that. Well, reality is fantastic. You know, reality, you know, and I look at this as I contemplate the euro, and uh, you know, I've got so many people in continental Europe saying, "Oh, it's these British, these these English speakers," they call them. Um, you know, they say, uh, "How is the euro is going to break up?" This is unthinkable. You know, and, you know, as if that makes it okay, right? It's unthinkable. All that you need is more political will. You've just got to throw more stuff at it to keep it together. The fact that it's an economic nonsense <laughs> is not there. And I think, you know, eventually, reality comes through. Oh, yes, and it's sir. come through in China and it's come through in India. Yes, it took a time. It takes a time. It can take, a, it can take half a century, but it comes through in the end. Well, Papa said psychology follows logic. You know, what, yeah, what, what's first logical yeah. 
eventually the mine catches up and Hume said this as well you know yes, eventually the, 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 the human race will catch up with the with the truth yes it's a good point or die in the attempt maybe <laughs> or both <laughs> well Russell said people would sooner uh, oh. die than think in fact they do <laughs> <laughs> this is probably a, a slightly obscure question but do you have any idea why it is that Friedman was against a, uh, a commodity standard to the extent that he was I don't know whether he given the um, fact that one had operated successfully for the best part of 50 years in the late 19th century uh, <laughs> I wasn't aware that he was all that against a commodity standard. I wouldn't have described him as that. I mean, he does in the um, essays on positive economics, he does talk about a commodity standard. And he goes into some detail about what it might look like. Uh, what he was... I, I, I think subsequently, I think he probably rethought that because I certainly remember him talking about gold, which I put it to you as a commodity, um, and, and saying that, well, it's unusable as a currency, therefore you're going to have to have bits of paper, and therefore years. you're a problem. Hmm? It's, it, it just seems a strange perspective to take, given the fact that it had been used for the best part of 50 years, right through Europe and uh, elsewhere as well. Well, I think that his view was that the... Yeah, Economies had, had grown and marched on since then. There was a fixed supply of gold that, that, um, that it depended very much on, you know, mining and technology and all sorts of things like that. So, so it wasn't, you know, what he was trying to get at, I think, is, you know, this is sort of basis of, of monetarism. The basis of monetarism is, you know, you know how, can, how can we design a, a monetary system where... Basically, we, we have prices doing that. Predictability. Rather than that, 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 yes. that and yes. certainly not that. So, um, gold is no good at that, actually. Did it for 50, I, 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 I well, I find it so hard to understand why somebody like Friedman, a very clever man who read all of history and knew a lot of stuff and, right. and knew his, his statistics and his historical evidence, Absolutely. would say, well, what we want to achieve is broadly stable prices. So let's get the government to control the money supply because then they can achieve that. Uh, and of course, gold can't do it. Whereas the historical record was that's exactly what gold had achieved and exactly what no government had ever achieved. No, that's not, that's not quite true. Um, his view was that there had been, and you know, his, his historical view, I mean, I mean, he and Anna Schwartz, who's still alive, absolutely yes. brilliant. Matters of much hair, but brilliant. Uh, she, you know, she, um, she and he, uh, you know, did, did, yeah, you got the book, a huge, two, two, two enormous books, Monetary History of Monetary Trends, going back to 1861. Um, and, you, you know, they'd done all this stuff on this. You know, he knew this backwards. I mean, he, was, he, just, he just knew all this stuff. And, and his view was that even under the gold standard, there were frequent crises that, you know, from time to time, it buggered up big time. Um, and the 1907 bank crash, you know, occurred under a gold standard. So gold, he thought, was not the answer to everything. And that a better, you know, partly because of all these different pressures on it, they've got demand pressures and supply pressures and so on. And his view was that it would actually be... Hmm, I think his view was that it would actually be better if you had, it doesn't matter whether it's a fiat currency, as long as it grows at a predictable rate. If it grows at a predictable rate, then prices will continue at a predictable rate, and then people can make rational investment decisions on the basis of it. Whereas gold, you know, something might happen tomorrow, gold is not worth any money anymore, and that's it. Had it didn't happen in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, cheers. Enjoy the dinner. Oh, come on. Everybody of any class has just left. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. The main question has just left, so we ought to uh, finish the meeting. Thank you very much for doing that. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you.